Okay, I think we'll we'll make a start. Gary, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Great stuff. Likewise. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are obviously live, so um, we're happy to take your questions throughout the evening. And if you'd like to, if you're on Zoom and you'd like to post any questions, then please do use the Q&A function and we'll ask Gary questions as he goes along. I'm sure lots of you will have lots of questions, so we'll try and get through as many as possible. If you're watching on Facebook, because we're live on Facebook tonight as well, then use the um, comments function below and post your questions on there and I'll, I'll be monitoring as many as possible. So um, there we go. So it's, it's a great privilege to introduce Gary. We, Ellis Brigham have just started working with um, MWIS and I'd encourage you to go and check out the website. There's loads of useful information on there after, after this evening's talk. So um, it's a, we've just got this partnership going with them in, back in January. So hopefully it will come in handy when we're allowed to um, go back into the hills and start wandering again, which hopefully won't be too soon, uh, too, too long, too far away. <laughs> um, so quick introduction to Gary, he's, he's worked for MWIS for um, seven years now, and um, he's, he's highly qualified. He's uh, a degree in meteorology. Um, he's also background in geography, and he's one of a small team at MWIS who work 365 days a year to bring you uh, forecasting and um, all the information around sort of the, the hills and mountains around the UK. So. Um, like I say, go and, go and check them out. It's a really good resource. So um, please give them your support and I will, um, I will hang it, hand over to Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you to Ellis Brigham for hosting the event this evening and everyone out there watching. And hopefully it gives you um, something entertaining on another one of these lockdown evenings. Hopefully we've got uh, a sense of uh, improving times ahead. It might be a while till we're properly getting the mountains back where we'd want them to be in uh, in terms of getting there. Hopefully something entertaining, something interesting for you throughout here, a whistle stop tour, if you like, of uh, all things mountain weather. As Mark said, my background has come up meteorology through a geographical background. And for the job of doing mountain weather forecasting in all intents and purposes, the concepts of pattern recognition, local patterns, uh, understanding of just that small scale situations across British weather is all critical. So um, I think hopefully that will come through in this talk tonight as to just how localised and how varied our weather very much can be. Um, what we want to do, have it relatively interactive as we go through um, this evening for you, we'll take a few questions as we go along basically, just see how things uh, pan out. Mark will chip in with your uh, questions as we, uh, as we take things through. We will dive in and basically these statements, I guess, sum up the basic goal of forecasting through and through that if you can get all this lot together, you're not a million miles away from a total weather forecast in many respects for the British Isles. It can just come down to as simple as this, but the complexity that all this then brings uh, on a day to day weather um, so many variables come together basically any day any day's weather forecasting if you know for where you are uh, which way the wind is blowing the basic direction and then when they where that air itself has come from there's so much of the story that we can build and hopefully at the end of uh, tonight uh, these uh, statements uh, will ring loud and clear in in your idea of what british weather uh, can do We'll, as I say, a fairly whistle-stop tour of various things and we'll, we'll uh, divert as we go along, basically. I thought interesting to start with a chart like this, which is the wind chill values, basically, and it's something that was all too notable in the forecasts through the early part of February, at least. Obviously, it's become a bit milder in recent times, but we were having some very severe wind chill values very commonly for a number of days altogether. And um, we will refer to a chart such as this for wind speed and temperature to calculate wind chill that you'll often see in our forecast. It's all been calculated scientifically over the years. And it just shows how quickly I think conditions can become very severe indeed on the mountains, even 
what could be considered a fairly modest temperature, zero Celsius, add a 30 mile an hour wind on that, that's not necessarily a gale day, but already you're getting to a wind chill real feel factor at uh, around minus 11. So any exposure to that, if you have an accident on the hills, you know, you're very quickly getting into serious conditions. And once you're just going down the temperature and adding the wind speed, the whole thing just escalates. And we were very much commonly in early February seeing wind chill values that we were putting in our forecasts below minus 20, minus 25, and wouldn't have been far off minus 30 on the odd day. I think certainly in the, uh, the, the big beast from the east pattern that came in, Back in 2018, I certainly remember writing a minus 30 wind chill value across the Cairngorms. We have been seeing temperatures down at minus 11 or 12 on the recordings from Cairngorm Summit in early February. Um, so, yeah, just an, an idea of how cold really things were earlier, earlier on this month. So that's uh, sort of whets your appetite for being on the hills as soon as you can consider just where those low temperatures go to when you add on just that exposure to the wind. Um, a chart like this, uh, just to try and begin really with where the concept of our forecasting goes. And, and sometimes I throw some charts a bit like this on the, on the video uh, that we put out on YouTube. Um, it's essentially just trying to give you a feel for where the big weather patterns go. We're at the mercy of weather that can come from any point on the compass, really, at any point in time. Uh, it's all affected by what's going on all around the hemisphere in, in many respects. This is a forecast chart. This is for this week. This is uh, essentially showing pressure anomalies over a week as a whole. It shows where higher or lower than average pressure patterns exist. And there's always this uh, anomalous situation going on. The atmosphere is working very much like a fluid in many respects. The whole thing is just rotating around and uh, weather regimes are moving around the hemisphere all the time. Essentially, it's uh, broad areas of, of air that have different temperatures in many respects. It's, it's a, a constant cycling round of, of temperature across the hemisphere, our weather, we look to the Atlantic for where it's coming in from. Um, what happens over the Atlantic is dictated to what goes on over North America, and that is dictated to why, what, by what happens over the Pacific, and to some extent that is influenced by what goes on around Southeast Asia. It all goes around the sequence, more or less, in terms of producing the overall weather patterns, what goes on over the North Pole as well, uh, cyclical variations of weather patterns there all do have a role in just what comes in our direction. And what we're seeing at this point in time uh, is a broad zone of high pressure effectively, which is in existence across uh, much of Europe into Scandinavia, up to polar regions, and a broad zone of low pressure that exists this week out over the North Atlantic. And we're thinking about the jet stream. I mean, the jet stream in many respects is a bit of a chicken and egg uh, situation in that they talk on the, the TV weather about, oh, the jet stream is coming back across us and that is driving the weather. Well, yes, it does. But the jet stream itself is driven by the contrasts of temperature uh, across portions of the hemisphere so that essentially where you have the greatest temperature gradient if you like and at the moment this zone across the North Atlantic here that's about where the jet stream exists coming in towards Britain it's turning the airflow basically as a, a south by southwesterly uh, some of that airflow as well is coming round uh, out of southern parts of Europe towards us right now so it's a mild pattern uh, any point uh, where this pattern just shuffles itself round, we effectively get uh, a different side of the weather story. It just depends how all these various pieces move around and they do so over weeks and months and they vary over years. And that is all part and parcel of what the weather on a broad scale that gets thrown towards us. If we just for interest and in what's been happening in recent times, across North America because some very severe conditions existed as you've probably seen on the news in recent times uh, particularly in Texas 
Now, this was uh, a chart which, again, the same concept as of a chart that we've just looked at. It's pressure anomalies showing where lower and higher pressure patterns existed. This was in the period up until the 20th of February. It's a five day average. And just have a look uh, at the bottom of this chart and, and what's happening over North America. At this point in time, we've got a what we call a broad upper level trough in existence. And that was essentially a, a large zone of very cold air that was in existence over North America, uh, effectively being drawn in out of polar regions, all squashed in between a couple of zones of higher pressure, which existed out over the Pacific and out over the Atlantic. And, and that trough pattern was what just drew a very cold air mass down into uh, the far south of the USA through that period. And that's what effectively triggered that very, very cold pattern. Uh, quite anomalous, really, but these things do have their variability over many, many years. And it all just depends how meandering this uh, upper level weather pattern is in terms of of any weather that we get when things are very loopy, if you like, in terms of these high and low pressure systems, then you can get these great anomalies of warm and cold air that move themselves north or south relative to what would be considered normal. And it's all that uh, meandering nature of, of the weather uh, that just dictates what we will get. Any time when it's a little bit more what we call zonal, which is west to east flowing, uh, then we get a more sort of average conditions coming in on westerly winds towards Britain, for example. But if we get something that's a little bit more of uh, this sort of more mer meridional, we call it, pattern, this is where things are flowing more north to south, then we can get these extremes of, of warm and cold. And that's sort of what happened for us recently and what happened over North America as well. Just to contrast that, that is a actual temperature chart for, um, again, the period up until the 20th of February when uh, North America was seeing its deep cold. You can see the temperatures way, way below long-term averages across that swathe of North America. At this point in time as well, there was a broad zone of cold that existed across uh, Eastern Europe, across much of Russia. Uh, at that point, we'd just about finished our uh, worst of our cold spell and we were already getting back into milder weather patterns you can just see again how there are variations all the way around the hemisphere in terms of essentially very large bubbles of warm and cold air masses that exist and it's just where those move around to as to uh, the weather patterns in play. Um, we think about climate change and I won't dwell too far into that because that can go down a completely different uh, subject this evening. But in terms of long term changes, these what we call meandering patterns, the suggestion being that maybe they are becoming a bit more common, partly connected to changing in temperature gradients between polar regions as they warm and tropical regions aren't warming quite as quickly. That effect is a broad scale view of a knock on effect on the jet stream is just maybe slowing down the general intensity of, of jet stream on an average scale. Uh, the suggestion that that maybe is contributing towards maybe greater extremes of weather that are occurring. You bear in mind, though, that there's plenty of other factors, natural variability at play as well, on top of any signal of, of changing climate and day to day weather is as much about just the patterns that play. Um, when we deal with analysing climate change, we really look at what's going on in the, the longer term. So to bring that a little bit closer to home and any good meteorological textbook will show you uh, something much like this in terms of what comes toward the British Isles in weather patterns and what we call air masses, essentially. Um, again, all points of the compass are very much covered here. And each one of these named air masses essentially has different characteristics. And as that moves towards us, uh, we are then affected by those uh, differing uh, characteristics of weather. It's just bringing the air from wherever it's come from and modifying it as it comes towards the British Isles. So anything that comes in from the Southwest as say a tropical maritime that started out life way out over the mid-Atlantic has got greater amounts of moisture, greater amounts of temperature, and that just moves its way towards us, that encounters a cooler environment, and the end result can just tend to be, yes, mild, 
but very damp air that comes in. So if you end up in a situation where your western hills and mountains are clagged in with very low cloud, the tropical maritime has probably got your name on it because that just brings a lot of moisture towards our shores. By contrast, the polar maritime has come from a cooler source region. Now that exists, say, over the North Atlantic. It can have started out life over northern Canada and Greenland as well, which starting out in a very cold environment, again, that air will move out over a moderately warmer sea and come towards us into a, a slightly warmer environment. Now this produces unstable conditions, it produces showers essentially as anything comes in from a cooler source. Um, the air tends to be a little bit clearer, you tend to get higher cloud bases, um, anything that comes around from the west or northwesterly isn't quite as uh, filled in with moisture but it can still produce very showery and unsettled weather. The one in between, which is the interesting one, and it's one that we get all too often, the so-called returning polar maritime pattern. This is a bit of a combination, a hybrid of both, really. Uh, the sense that any air that starts out life quite commonly towards way towards our northwest, often around areas of low pressure, which exists just to the west of Britain, that air gets drawn away towards the Azores even sometimes, uh, air that essentially is cool and fairly unstable and has the ability to produce showers, gets some added moisture, some added temperature, and that just invigorates the whole pattern even more. And the whole thing then just throws the kitchen sink at us, basically, which again is a very common pattern in terms of some heavy rain that comes in from the Atlantic. That uh, any air that you know can be coming in from the southwest, some of that kind of started life further northwest. So there's subtle variations. That's where you really just start to think of where the air has come from in terms of the weather that is going on. No two southwesterly winds are necessarily exactly the same in that respect. Uh, just to briefly fill the circle round, basically, if you go round further to the north, an Arctic maritime air comes from um, essentially a, an environment that has lower humidity. So this doesn't bring a great deal of moisture in total. It brings with that much clearer conditions. So when we sometimes talk about superb visibility in our mountain forecasts, it's probably got an Arctic maritime flavor to it, a pure northerly regime um, that comes down from the North Pole uh, can bring showers, snow and some hail mixed in, but also can bring some very clear conditions, the low humidity, uh, with that is really what's uh, king in terms of that clarity of the air and the greater chance of cloud bases being higher. You turn all of that round and you look at a polar continental air mass, now that comes in from a dry source essentially with a lot of land mass that the air has originated from. Um, it does pick up a bit of moisture over the North Sea and sometimes that can result in low cloud and fog as all of that uh, uh, air that passes across the North Sea uh, can then just create a bit of clag down the eastern side of the country. Now it varies between, win between winter and summer in terms of air that comes in from uh, any easterly sources in the winter time as we've seen recently a polar continental air mass is a very cold one and can produce snow showers as that uh, picks up the moisture over the North Sea but again in terms of total precipitation tends not to be huge amounts and just to briefly fill that round to the south uh, tropical continental does what it says it's essentially a very warm air mass or a mild air mass. Any time of year that something comes in effectively from the Mediterranean, it's going to bring something uh, mild for the time of year, so to speak. And that, that's maybe the concept of all of this. That My pet peeve, I suppose, if you like, in weather forecasting speak is any reference to what things should be for any time of year. Uh, it all depends which way the air is coming from in so many respects in that you look at what we're seeing this week in the temperatures for the later part of February, well we're seeing an airflow that's coming up on a, a south or southwesterly. Naturally that's going to bring some very mild or warm conditions. So if you think what the February temperature should be with the wind coming from the south southwest it's pretty much what it is at the moment the long-term average of course is everything muddled together and you're looking at going to look at what has happened in February 2021 chances are the month is going to come out somewhere near to average in in its overall temperature but you combine the very cold start with the very mild finish and you all end up averaging things out but day-to-day -day weather in terms of what it should be all just depends which way the wind is coming from um, anyone want to 
dive in with anything on air masses before we rattle on any further. I'll allow. Um, sorry, Gary, there's a couple of questions mm. that have come in. Um, just on the, I'm not sure which slide it was. I think it's the slide before this one. Someone was asking what the colours mean. Uh, on that one, the temperature chart, was it this one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that is, it's a temperature anomaly. So it's difference from long term average is what we're seeing on, on that chart. So the way you've got the blues and pinks and purples, temperatures are well below long term averages. So it's, it's comparing what is happening through that particular five day window, which is up until the 20th of February, um, with what the long term average temperatures would be. So if you look at North America, um, you were dealing with well, below 10 degrees, below seasonal averages in through that sort of spell. So it, it's it's looking at temperatures by contrast to what would be average for that time of year. So yeah, when you're into the, the blues, you're seeing below average temperatures. If you're in the oranges and reds, um, you're seeing above average temperatures. And again, it's all part and parcel of just where the big scale weather patterns around the hemisphere are, are going. Great, thanks, Gary. There's just uh, two more questions of me. Mm -hmm. The um, Richard asked, do MWIS and Met Office forecasters use the same base information to create their forecasts? So any differences are down to the interpretation of the data by the respective forecasts? Um, I get, the answer to that maybe is you'd have to ask them. I mean, we, we don't have any direct link with the Met Office. I mean, what we do, our job really is interpreting charts. We're looking at a wealth of data from uh, put out essentially from meteorological centres all around the world. Um, there's a, a wealth of computer modelling that we um, study on a day-to-day -day basis so I mean through our own experience of forecasting we will sort of almost pick and choose the forecast model of the moment if you like that we understand has maybe got the best handle on what's going on so we we will analyze a whole wealth of data it may be that Met Office forecasters do the same sort of thing they may use their own Met Office data a little bit more um, directly I suppose because that's their um, center that they're working with all forecasters will analyze a wealth of data from different sources. I mean, in terms of which forecasting model may or may not be the best over a long enough period of time, they'll all, they've all got their good merits. The, the day where they're all slightly different is where we have our headaches, basically, because that's where we're trying to figure out what's going on and ends up with low confidence in the forecast. Um, but yeah, we, 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 through experience, I guess, have, have come to know which of the forecasting models have the best sort of diagnostic tools if you like, to um, give us the best information for putting our mountain forecast together. Maybe is the best way of looking at it. We, chances are we're all sort of looking at something similar, but it's just uh, how, how that's being interpreted and that's that's what we're doing. Hope, hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Gary. I'll, uh, I'll save the, the rest. Yeah, we'll, we'll rattle on. Hope it might be that as we go along, things, uh, uh, you know, any other questions get answered along the way. We will get gradually more and more in depth to, um, specific mountain events as we go on through uh, the session. Now, classic fronts that we uh, see on TV weather, and you'll see them on our videos as well. These are essentially just the boundaries between uh, those big scale air masses. So we were talking about those tropical maritime versus polar maritime. Well, they do meet somewhere over the North Atlantic and where they do, that's where fronts form. And essentially this is the life cycle of a frontal system that comes in from the Atlantic. Basically things start out life where you have, let's say somewhere off Newfoundland, um, cold air to the North, warmer air to the South, you're on a front which is more or less in a straight line. Uh, basic processes of air that sort of moves against itself really. You have warmer air and colder air, warmer air tends to sort of being less dense, ride over colder air so it does tend to rise. You will just sort of shuffle the whole thing around. It begins to circulate eventually as, as one body of air rides over another and you go through the stages of, of a develop, developing depression, essentially, as we'd call it, mid-latitude cyclone, mid-latitude depression. It forms an area of low pressure, essentially, and that's what all too often is moving in across the British Isles. And it does tend to just follow in sequence through, as you can see here, from top to bottom, more or less. And once the system has become what we call occluded, um, that 
really is where the warmer air that was within a warm sector, which is between the warm and the cold fronts, gets lifted off the surface really. So it becomes uh, lifted higher up. There isn't really the sense of seeing um, the temperature difference across the front at the surface. All is starting to get towards its uh, latter part of its life cycle of the weather system. The thing that's driving it, which is the temperature and humidity contrasts, uh, has done its job. It's produced the cloud bearing, rain bearing system that then spins its way across the British Isles. So that's it's all just air that's moving around against itself that generates our weather. These are the dynamic weather systems, basically. These are the things that are real uh, weather makers in terms of what comes in off the Atlantic. And it's that constant um, imbalance between warmer and colder air masses, the atmosphere, um, just constantly trying to balance itself out between warm and cold across the mid latitudes and that's just the ongoing sequence of weather that comes in our direction. Very briefly again it's out of a textbook essentially what you would see of warm and cold fronts I won't dwell on this too far it's just the cross section if you like of what you would see uh, of a frontal system that comes through. Uh, it gives maybe the sense that the warm air does tend to ride up over cooler air um, and that as you get a weather system coming in from the Atlantic basically brings gradually lowering cloud, it brings rain on uh, and then you tend to get the milder air that, uh, that follows a cold front that eventually comes in from the west uh, as that begins to cut in as colder air arrives it creates instability, it creates uh, heavier rain bearing clouds and showers which then follow so I won't maybe get too in depth on that, hopefully that just gives you maybe a schematic of what's going on uh, within a weather system like that. Um, now, all that weather gets thrown at us from the Atlantic on a regular basis, the prevailing west southwest that's the most common weather. So for all those air masses, for all those wind directions, we still have something that is more frequent, and that is um, the west by southwesterlies. And that maybe is told by a chart like this. This is the rainfall annual average over a 30 year period. And this maybe starts to just tell a tale a little bit about the fact that the mountains modify and enhance and make their own weather. You could be forgiven looking at a chart like this for thinking it was a terrain map of the British Isles that this is actually showing landscape and the hills because it almost uh, matches like for like in terms of where the greatest rainfall occurs over uh, a calendar year. Um, with maybe just the exception of the area around the Cairngorms, which uh, being somewhat sheltered from the West Highlands doesn't quite pick up on uh, the same volume of rainfall as it would out west. But it really does highlight um, just how the mountains do enhance rainfall that comes in. Our western coast would already be wetter than the east, simply because that's where the weather comes from. But the fact that the hills and the mountains are there, it, it does just enhance that story. And that is a process uh, more or less like this. This is what we call orographic enhancement. Complicated phrase for simply the mountains making heavier rainfall. Now, essentially, the air that comes in from the Atlantic on those west or southwesterly winds um, comes up against the hills and mountains that exist across much of Western Britain. And as it does so, that air has got to go somewhere. It, is forced to rise basically as it comes up against the hills. As the air rises, as it does, it cools, it condenses, that then forms cloud and that cloud then leads to rain and you end up with a situation where yeah there's already weather coming in, there's already rain going on, but this enhanced lifting of air over the hills just creates extra rainfall as uh, that process unfolds. If the hills weren't there, that extra lift of the air, that extra kick that it gets by being forced upwards uh, wouldn't occur. So the hills and the mountains on the western side of Britain being in existence make more rainfall across uh, those parts from Snowdonia to the Lake District to Western Scotland. By contrast to that, on the lee side, the downwind side of the mountains, we get a situation where we call it a rain shadow, where all of that extra moisture that has rained itself out across the mountains in the west, well, that's been lost from the system, basically. And the air that then moves further towards the east, it comes down slope off the mountains, various physical processes are taking place, and that air ends up drier, 
then it started. Basically, it's lost its moisture by raining it out. And all those processes sometimes and quite often can lead to what we call the phone effect, which is quite simply the fact that point E on this chart ends up even warmer than point A, simply just through processes of losing moisture, air rising and falling as air descends, it becomes compressed a little bit and warming takes place. And those lee areas, you're thinking in the southwesterly wind of places, for example, on um, the Moray coast, maybe down the eastern side of the Pennines, you can get extra mild air that exists just simply because the air itself has crossed the hills and lost its moisture. Um, sometimes this is quite a marked situation. It doesn't even have to be um, particularly wet weather that creates this. If you've got a, a very damp atmosphere that's producing a lot of drizzle and low cloud out towards the west or the southwest, say, and even you've just lost that relative moisture, you can create these uh, very localised warm spots. In the wintertime particularly, you can get places, let's say, uh, on a southerly wind uh, with this effect taking off where you're way up into the mid or even high teens, somewhere in the north of Scotland. Uh, I think the record uh, for January is, is somewhere like Lag in the north of the Highlands, which would have got to about 18 degrees in January. And it's these processes of the air crossing the hills uh, and then descending and warming as it does so that creates those local warm spots. Now then, everybody's favourite scene on the hills, the good old inversion, and we'll just explain a little bit about that because there's something, the real holy grail of being on the hills that you want to experience, that delightful moment where you come up through the cloud, you've been in the murk and the damp, and you appear out of the top of that and you get a sea of fog below you, and it's maybe all the, the better. Um, <laughs> if you I guess the cloud is halfway up the hill where you thought you were just going to go into a great big fog bank and all of a sudden a few more hundred meters you come right out of the top of it altogether and you look down on that cloud bank so it doesn't necessarily have to be fog that's in the valleys or the glens it can be a bank and a sheet of low cloud that exists sort of say halfway up and this was a situation there were some really classic inversions which were around in august last year and that was a view just looking down on glencoe um, over a few days, in fact, there was some absolute classic inversion conditions where some very damp air was just trapped um, lower down. And meanwhile, drier, uh, warmer air was in existence higher up on the mountains. So what's going on to create that situation? We've talked about it here at uh, MWIS quite a bit in some of the videos and the blogs over the uh, past months. Um, it's a situation like this. Now we suddenly throw you in with some very technical charts here, it must be said, but look at the chart on the left. This is a vertical profile of the atmosphere, um, which is taking you up from eventually sea level at the bottom, right the way up to more or less the, trop the top of the troposphere, which is uh, up at around 300 millibars. You're up at the best part of um, 30,000 feet uh, in, in that respect. So you, you're looking way, way up in the atmosphere in, in that uh, situation but we're concentrating on the bottom part of what's going on here and, and it's the sense that the temperature inversion exists is where we have generally a zone of high pressure under high pressure air is just very slowly descending as it descends that zone of compression takes place it creates some warming and it can just trap the cooler denser air below that zone which just tends to hang about below an inversion. So it's that air that's happening higher up in the atmosphere, just higher up above the hills, that just gradually descends underneath higher pressure environments that leads to a, a drying out, a warming of the air higher up, and it leaves uh, a cooler, damper layer lower down. And that's essentially the inversion where normal circumstances would be that temperature would fall with height, but plenty of times it doesn't. And that gradual lowering of temperature with height reverses itself and you end up in a situation where the temperature with added height suddenly goes a bit higher um, than you would have been under so-called normal circumstances. It's uh, typically all seen under these uh, more stable weather environments, um, as we call it, where high pressure is in charge. The air itself then is not wanting to rise. It's just gradually descending in a quiet weather regime and that can just lead that fog layer to be trapped beneath it 
Um, I'll have a look at the chart on the right in a moment. I'll just show you a satellite picture because that was what we had in the middle of August last year when this sort of situation was happening. Uh, have a look across northern Britain there. We've got uh, sheets of very low stratus cloud. We'd had a very humid atmosphere that had come up from the south leading up to this, which had left a lot of moisture available. Some of that had condensed over the North Sea and that uh, North Sea low cloud, half, ret, whatever you want to call it, had lapped well inland across northeast England, central Scotland, it had more or less sort of wrapped itself around Scotland as a whole. But just notice the gaps in that cloud, and that's the zones of much higher terrain across the Cairngorms, the Western Highlands, that were poking through above that fog layer, and that's a classic satellite picture for seeing that. Um, Again, Lake District, Northwest England, the barrier of the Pennines, to all intents and purposes, was stopping uh, that North Sea clag from getting further westwards. The whole uh, idea of that cooler, moist air being trapped just below the inversion, it couldn't get westwards across the Pennines. It was all held down uh, at lower levels in Northeast England. So it's very easy in meteorological sense to get air not to go where you might think it would want to go. It, it, a bit like the tide coming in, if you like, that it, it will keep itself where it wants to be. Um, it doesn't want, in these certain, certain situations, that air and the damp air uh, can just quite easily be trapped in place uh, in that sense. Now, we just, uh, I'll just finish the counter thoughts to that, which is the concept of an unstable atmosphere, which is the chart on the right hand side here. Um, and that is a completely different weather situation. Realistically, that's a situation where there is uh, a very marked fall of temperature with height, basically, is the simple sense of this. Um, when temperature is falling dramatically with height, it can rise buoyantly. And as soon as it can rise buoyantly, um, you can create big shower clouds, basically. The air itself is rising, cooling, condensing, and you end up with a situation where big cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds can froth themselves up. You can sometimes see them growing in front of your eyes, that that sort of a cloud will just grow vertically. When the air is very unstable, um, it will just rise and rise and create big shower clouds, and that can create hail, it can create thunderstorms as well and the satellite picture would look completely different. So we'd have a situation where you've got big clumpy shower clouds that uh, are affecting Britain with some uh, good downpours thrown in for good measure. Now another slightly technical chart to sort of follow that thought all the way through. Um, this is a chart that's sort of middle levels in the atmosphere, you're about five kilometres up at this level. Now that would correspond to the previous um, satellite picture uh, we've got a zone of cold air, essentially, that's moved across northern Britain within an upper level trough, as we call it, um, and that body of cold air that's come in, probably come in as a polar maritime air mass, um, that is the trigger for producing those big showers. That air can just rise buoyantly to produce showers. So on that day in history, you would have been finding lots of heavy showers, probably some hail coming in across Western Britain. It was all on a westerly flow. It's that uh, instability that produces uh, showery weather. So that's a different situation um, to what we mentioned earlier on, where we're talking about weather fronts that are dynamic processes, where it's contrasting air, uh, warm and cold air, bumping into each other effectively, producing um, frontal systems and rain-bearing cloud. This is a different situation. This is convective processes. This is just a body of air uh, creating the weather in terms of showers. The, it's not a contrast of air as such at the surface that's producing the weather. This is, um, the contrast is, is vertical in many respects. It's the, it's the change of temperature from surface to higher levels that's producing weather in, in that sense. Um, so yeah, that chart on the right, as seen there, anything where the air drop of temperature with height is very rapid, that is what produces the showers, it's instability in the atmosphere. Um, I'll briefly pause there, whether there's any, any feedback or any questions going along just at the moment on that. Plenty to take in, we could spend hours trying to explain what's going on with some of that, it must be said. There, there are a few questions, Gary. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. Uh, one second. Lots of people asking if there's any good books that you'd recommend. 
on this topic? Yeah, um, there's there's various uh, one. I've got, I've got a few. Just uh, with nothing that we've got that we could directly be endorsing ourselves. But I, I've got one just to hand, and maybe just to give you a um, again with nothing to do with us. But it's one that I quite like. It's one that's called Thirty Second Meteorology, which has got a lot of um, concepts in there, um, broken down into fairly simple. Um, digestible bite size moments if that's not direct endorsement I'm, you know not involved with that book but i do quite like it if someone wants to just get into meteorology and, and the concepts of forecasting that's quite a nice one um that i found that we we've often been asked are we going to write our own forecasting book i think we should get around to doing something like that one day but uh, <laughs> there you go absolutely jill jill baker asks how far ahead can you accurately predict air mass movement um again it will vary to some extent depending on just how um mobile the weather pattern is i i think we're a pretty good good up to about a week and maybe a bit more in terms of where these large bodies of air move to i, I still think that once we get beyond um, maybe a week to 10 days, the forecasting simulations still leave a little bit to be desired. They're getting a lot better. And sometimes we can get good trends out of those broad scale patterns, um, you know, over several weeks ahead. Um, so thinking back to a chart like that, we, we can start to see the trends. And especially if we're watching the trends build up over a number of days, um, we can sort of get the rough feel for a few weeks ahead as to where these big players get to. But yeah, I think in terms of sensible sort of day-to-day -day forecasting, um, once you're beyond about a week, you, you're starting to maybe get into the realms of, is what you're saying better than just almost a chance sort of 50-50, would it go that way or the other? You get to a point where you've got maybe a a 20% chance of any one of five variables happening eventually. So that, that becomes maybe, a, you know, the further ahead you go, you, you, you sort of into the realms of uh, yeah. no better than just a chance outcome. Thanks, Gary. Fiona asks, why don't air masses get named in weather forecasts very often? Um, it maybe goes beyond, I don't know, that the the technical capabilities of what they want to show and describe really and once or twice i've seen even on the bbc forecast a little bit more on their in-depth stuff occasionally they'll refer to it but not not often i mean they don't often throw it in They're, occasionally if something quite marked is happening they will um but yeah the these um broad scale bodies of air that they, they do stick out in in forecasting textbooks but but yeah not so much on the day-to-day -day weather as i say that the maybe the, the, they, they should sometimes explain things a little bit better in terms of where the air has actually come from. Some, some of the forecasters do a reasonable job, but yeah, not, not that often in terms of describing these. One, one final question before you carry on. You got yeah. okay. Graham asks, as I understand it, cool air falls and creates high pressure, which brings a sustained period of stable weather with blue skies and warm sunshine. If that's the case, though, why doesn't that warm weather actually create low pressure? Um, very complicated uh, description. I, just go back on the on the last bit of that. I'll try and explain that. So he says, uh, as he understands it, cool air falls and creates high pressure, which brings a sustained period of stable weather with blue skies and warm yeah. sunshine. If that's the case, why doesn't that warm weather actually create low pressure? I suppose over a, that's a difficult one to explain in a, in a simple term, I suppose. Um, and any, I, I'm trying to think the best way to try and explain any of that really, that you, you, the whole air that's rising and falling is starting to sort of generate the weather pattern in play. So if you've got sort of a generally sort of a coolish body of air, as I sort of said, it as it as it descends, it does tend to warm, which stabilizes things. It's it's that maybe concept of stability that is what's sort of going on in some to some extent. Any any air that begins on mass to descend um, is creating a stable situation. Um, perhaps not an easy one to to explain directly without having to divert down a very long long way. But I I, I think 
at any time it, it, it's a it's looking at the what's going on in terms of surface weather versus what's going on higher up, I suppose. It's the contrast between sort of the sea level temperature or you know, ground level temperature versus the air aloft. So if you think about maybe in the summertime, um, you've got very warm air at the surface. If you get a slightly cooler body of air come across that, um, it destabilizes everything and to some extent that enhances the development of low pressure. Um, whereas if you've got a sort of a cool body of air, coming over a fairly warm um, or a warmer body of air, let's say coming over a cooler surface, it just tends to stabilize things. It probably, uh, hopefully some of what we've said maybe answers uh, some of that already, but uh, maybe not, not easy to <laughs> dwell too, too okay. uh, heavily in. Um, what I'll do, and we'll just sort of drift along and we'll, we'll have a look at what's um, going on at the moment in terms of some weather patterns or recently as well, um, as we, uh, to close. Just to follow on that showery situation, I want to show you a couple of charts here, just contrasting what's going on on a, on a southwesterly um, weather pattern, comparing, if you like, between winter and, and summer, um, winter on the left, summer on the right. And this is under sort of generally showery weather patterns or um, where precipitation is frequent and it's just giving that sort of localized effects of where the weather is happening. No great surprise that. Uh, in the winter at least, it's the western regions that are picking up on the greatest amounts of rainfall, first in the firing line to a southwesterly wind in many respects. What's maybe worth noting uh, on that is just how relatively sheltered the far north of Scotland is. The area around sort of Skye and, and Torridon, if the wind is from a southwesterly direction, you go a little bit further north. And actually, some of those west coastal mountains are sheltered very well uh, on a pure um, southwesterly wind uh, compared to areas around Mull, uh, the West Highlands further southwards, which just get hit by the first weather that's coming in just off the Atlantic. Yeah, Northern Ireland has a bit of a sheltering effect, but, but not, not enough to stop Western Scotland getting particularly wet. Um, what we're just sort of comparing, if anything, between winter and summer is where showers um, exist basically because in the winter time showers get triggered off over the sea um, the contrast of the relatively warm sea with cooler air that moves across the warm sea um, that's the thing that produces showers in the winter time so showers will rattle their way in from the Atlantic and come in from the coast basically in the summertime the opposite is maybe true where showers form over the heat of the land. So the, the daytime heating where you get some thermals going up in the heat of the summer sun, um, it's the land-based convection that drives showers through the summer part of the year. Add to that, you get some effects from coastal sea breezes. So you think that around all the coasts in the summertime, uh, we get a situation where um, localized wind patterns get themselves set up. The sea breezes just tend to blow inland um, towards the coast. Now the shape of our coastline in the southwest, let's say, and all around Wales as well, those peninsulas end up with some localized convergence going on. So the air sort of meets in the middle. It can only go one place, which is rising. And that on a southwesterly wind will create bands of showers that form across the southwest peninsula and run away inland. The same often happens across mid and south Wales. Showers run away into the Midlands. They'll happen over Snowdonia. And interestingly, we get some hot spots that pop up across um, northeastern hills and mountains as well. Now, this is partly because of uh, the sea breeze effect that kicks in off the North Sea. You've got a prevailing southwesterly, you've got a gentle local sea breeze effect coming in off the North Sea, and that tends to mean that air just meets in the middle and you get little zones of uh, more likely shower formation. Again, it's where the air is forced to rise uh, as those sort of wind patterns meet each other. So you've got a generally big southwesterly wind in place. It doesn't have to be a windy day, but that's the prevailing wind meeting some localized winds around the coast. And that creates just one or two hot spots. It can mean on the fairly slack southwesterly that there's the risk of a thunderstorm if all the atmospheric patterns are 
uh, in there. The risk of a thunderstorm around the Cairngorms, for example, that can be quite common on a, a summertime southwesterly. So uh, we really start to look at the effect of the coastline uh, in terms of showers and thunderstorms in the summertime for where they do form and actually local weather variations. And you change that wind direction slightly, the prevailing wind direction, you'll get quite a variation of just where those showers can occur. We just contrast that briefly with a northerly situation. Um, again, we just think about the summer, first of all, you're going to have a, an idea of some coastal effects, but there's also a little bit of uh, thermaling that can go up over the, uh, the hills, the, the bit of land-based heating that can create some showers across the West Highlands, a few bands of showers run uh, down the Pennines. Again, a little bit of coastal convergence uh, by the uh, sea breezes around the western coast, around the Irish Sea, uh, can add to that somewhat on a northerly wind. Um, but some of that is the daytime thermaling that goes off just locally in and around the hills. Now contrast that to the winter time because again we're back to showers that form over the sea in the winter time. So uh, we have a situation where it's uh, sea-based convection, um, relative warmth to the sea is what drives the showers and they will rattle themselves into the northern side of the highlands. You get the snow showers for example that come in from the North Sea into North uh, East England. And we get these little local effects, these bands that run in down the Irish Sea. Now that's being manipulated by the fact that the air has to squeeze itself effectively between the gap of Northern Ireland and Southwest Scotland around Stranra. Uh, low level air is forced between those land masses and as that gets squeezed in between it's forced to rise and that produces convection and showers and those showers that start out life there head their way southwards and they can cause what is infamously known as the Pembrokeshire Dangler, which is the band of showers that quite commonly on the northerly wind just intersects the west coast of Pembrokeshire and runs in for locally very frequent showers. And the same, just tip that wind north northwesterly slightly and some of those showers can run straight in across Snowdonia. It could be a situation where shower after shower after shower comes in in one location, you go five or ten miles up the road and they've hardly ever seen a shower all day. So these localised effects, local manipulation around the coasts and exactly which way the wind is blowing can just give you um, your local day-to-day -day variations. And again, if you just tip the wind from any slight direction, you'll just change the emphasis of who is going to see what in this existence. Some of those showers as well can get themselves all the way down to Bodmin Moor. Uh, some of the infamous uh, snowy events across uh, the A30 or the A38 uh, can all be triggered by this sort of uh, uh, wintertime shower activity, all starting out life just by the fact that the air has to get between Northern Ireland and Scotland. So that's just maybe a snapshot of some localised patterns which occur under, under showery situations. It's not uh, weather fronts, it's not dynamic weather, but it's local showery situations. They often say on the TV forecast, for example, that, oh, showers are pretty random, they occur almost anywhere. Well, they can do, but there is also some uh, pattern recognition in terms of different wind directions and where these showers will form. Um, so that's always comes into some of our local forecasting uh, and it's as much to do with the sea breezes uh, in the summer and also uh, coastal geography in the, in the winter time. And thinking of showers and downpours, we just look at the opposite side, which is the um, southerly airflow, effectively. This would be a tropical continental pattern. Uh, and this then was a chart from the, uh, the warmest day recorded in Britain, which was a couple of years ago uh, when it got to 38.8 seven at um, Cambridge. Now that day in history had a very strong southerly airflow, a real Spanish plume effect that was in existence, all being driven again by large scale atmospheric processes that was creating a very um, meridional north to south, south to north weather pattern, something like that. We'd have got a big zone of high pressure in existence somewhere across Central Europe. There was a developing low out over the Atlantic. You can see that there's a trail of cloud which was associated with a front which lies uh, through there. That was a cold front out there. Uh, this is your real uh, classic three hot days in a thunderstorm situation, really. It's the, the thing that makes that heat, that makes the pattern, is also what breaks it in the end because it's as that front moves in from the Atlantic, that creates the instability uh, already coming in ahead of that through some land-based convection over Europe. And as it did on that day in history, 
very hot conditions, but already destabilizing into big thunderstorms that were developing. And eventually the front that comes in from the west uh, brings a cooler and fresher air mass. Essentially what then happened, of course, is that that all uh, started to spin around and it led to some significant flooding issues uh, as we got into the end of July 2019 and just to the start of August in that month uh, uh, around my part of the world in the Peak District was hit badly by uh, uh, and some big rainfall events that uh, the reservoir at Whaley Bridge um, was the news story, of course, a bit later on, all following that sort of pattern. And that was a synoptic chart uh, from that particular day. So that's the showing where that front existed. It shows that zone of, of lower pressure that was around uh, over the Atlantic. And the idea, uh, maybe not easy to see on a, a chart like this, but, but the whole body of air that was coming in on a on a strong I'll draw it on a strong southerly airflow coming in ahead of that system before eventually we then had the, the change of air mass coming in from the Atlantic so a, a very marked airflow um, big tropical continental and that produced that very hot weather at that point in the, in the year What I want to do now, and I'm just going in the final stages, just to skip through what has happened recently and then where we're going um, next, basically, just to sort of give you a feel from some of these synoptic charts. Now, some of you may understand what's going on with these better than others, but hopefully we can get something out of the story just to sort of explain where we've, uh, where we've been and where we're going in uh, recent and ongoing times. This was a chart from the beginning or the early part of February. This is when all the snow was falling across uh, the highlands at that point and we got a, a low pressure system that was in charge we'd got a cold air mass that it was coming in from the east so we were we were dragging in some of the air off central eastern europe some of it was coming around a high over scandinavia so it was all dragging in colder air there was a slow moving front that lay toward the south and that was the thing that really hit the snow on that southeasterly flow that came in to the highlands uh, at, at that point in time. The, the contrast between colder air that was in existence and the moisture brought by a front that was producing all of that snow. Now, as time went on, uh, in the early part of uh, February, we then turned it into a very cold easterly flow, and that was where we were by the 9th of February. Um, the whole sequence of weather coming in uh, off the continent, off Scandinavia, that easterly flow that was in existence, high pressure laid to the north. Now this produced some local, again, coastal effects around the south of Scandinavia, where there was little bits of convergence lines, these lines that are coming in here. Uh, that's where the air has sort of come together around Denmark and Norway, and that banded together some of the uh, constant snowfall that ran in even to the central belt of Scotland, where it snowed uh, consistently over a few days. And that was traced back to what's going on uh, just with the air coming in off Scandinavia uh, on that easterly flow. All the maybe normal British weather at this point was running into Spain and Portugal. Uh, the low pressure systems were further to the south, we've got high pressure to the north. It's what we call quite a blocked pattern where we basically see high pressure just stuck in position around into the north of us and stops the Atlantic weather patterns getting any foothold at that point at least. Of course things did then change as we went uh, further onwards. Quick chart there that shows you that terrain was completely frozen. That was a, a freezing level chart from that spell earlier in February when practically all terrain was modelled as being frozen. Now things changed as we went on towards uh, the middle of this month. Uh, we were still in, under very cold conditions around the weekend of the 13th, 14th. High pressure was over the continent. The air was still coming towards us from Scandinavia, around the Baltic, uh, coming in across the cold heart of Europe and then around towards us on a southeasterly flow. That all was that very cold day, that uh, Saturday from a week or so ago, before things then began to change. And we could already see from a chart like this that there's already a lot of mild air over the Atlantic and various fronts coming in, that's knocking on the door and not too far away. And it won't take much from that um, situation. You tip the scale slightly. The very cold air that was in existence was replaced by the very mild air that was not too far away on a chart uh, like that. Which of course, if you then take things on for another day forwards, it was that mild Atlantic air that then began to win. Um, coming in on, on that strong south to southwesterly sequence, pushing the colder air back towards Eastern Europe, the fronts coming in, 
and the mild air swept through in quite a dramatic fashion. You went from having temperatures in the minus um, 23 is the very low temperature in Braemar under optimum conditions, and then you were climbing back to double figures for many places in the days that followed. And yeah, quite a shift of air masses, from one very cold Baltic air mass to one very mild Azores type of air mass, basically. Um, quite a, a marked shift of, of weather pattern. It's not absolutely unprecedented, but still quite dramatic nevertheless. I think even in the weather history of going back to the classic winter in 1947, maybe not uh, quite as marked, but there was, when that winter did end, there was a sudden lift of temperature, which then brought about a huge amount of flooding in, in that uh, weather history. So these things can happen. These things can go from very cold to very mild uh, in a fairly short space of time, just if you change the wind direction, uh, basically through, uh, through time. Um, and then we've just got stuck with mild south to southwesterlies ever since, basically. This is where we've just been uh, with that mild air coming up on that sort of big southerly flow. Um, to show you where we are, that's where we are at the moment. We've got low pressure out to the northwest, high pressure out over the continent, still a mild southwesterly through the middle of this week. Um, that's the broad scale weather pattern that's going on. Now, just as a snapshot of what we look at, imagine our forecasting day. I've got about 20 or 30 tabs of weather open to try and work out what's going on in terms of uh, uh, the weather story across the mountains. This is a snapshot. We're looking at things like this. You've got a general synoptic chart, a frontal chart with uh, some weather fronts on to understand what's going on. This is all for tomorrow, it must be said. This is uh, Tuesday's forecast. Um, yeah. Isobars close together, it's a windy day. The chart top right is the wind speed at what we call 900 millibars, hectopascals, it's the same thing. Uh, this is giving us a sense for what's going on higher up in the atmosphere. Well, at levels corresponding to the mountains, basically, we have to look above the surface to, uh, to get that. Um, so we're gauging the wind speed at height and how things are um, going for speed. So we're looking at those sorts of charts. We're looking at a temperature chart, for example, bottom left, where you're looking at, again, a, a temperature at a specific height in the atmosphere to try and give us a feel and the first guess for where temperatures are on the mountains. And the chart on the bottom right is one which projects cloud and where the cloud base comes in. And again, it's a first good guess for us as to where we write our cloud base forecasts. And once you're into the oranges and reds, you're practically uh, filling everything in from almost the lowest hill slopes upwards, which is what the forecast pretty much is for tomorrow across the western mountains of uh, Britain. Uh, it's a day tomorrow, actually, where you've got a very marked increase of wind speed with height uh, as uh, just within the broad warm sector coming in off the Atlantic things. Uh, uh, it creates the stability of the air. I won't dwell on this too much, maybe, but it's the sense that there is a bit of an inversion in play. It's not as good as you'd want in a stable weather situation for cloud inversions, but nevertheless, it creates a, a situation where the temperature fall with height is marginal, and that forces the air over the hills. It enhances the wind flow and just means that there's a very dramatic increase of wind speed with height. So it might not be a gale at the surface at sea level, but if you get up onto the hills tomorrow, it is absolutely going to be a howling of a wind with any increase of height. I won't dwell on that too much. I think we're probably already good for time. So what the whole mush all of that together and you end up with our classic forecast. The, uh, traditional PDFs that MWIS is uh, known and loved for, maybe sometimes hated for if there's words like this on it, if you were trying to go out on the hills where when there's a lot of words, there's a lot of weather happening. And uh, tomorrow is one of those days where you've got words like ferocious gusts may blow you over, which I think tells you everything you need to know about tomorrow's weather and all of that low cloud to boot. So that's the, the standard uh, forecast for a bad day on the hills. Maybe it's a a good day to be in lockdown, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a complicated sequence and maybe to rattle things through in an hour, that's not <laughs> easy to get everything in, but hopefully that's given you some insights into what we look at, um, just in terms of our forecasting. Thank you, Gary. And Anything to offer, Mark? We, um, we've had quite a few questions come through, as you might expect, <laughs> so I think if we can just grab five minutes, because we are yeah. sort of running over, over time a little bit, but um, quick, quick, easy one. The, the book that you mentioned, was that 30 second meteorology? Yeah. 
that was the book okay great yeah so some people were asking about that they didn't quite catch it yeah um, i think nothing to do with us directly but it's just a nice one that's a nice little sort of coffee table book for, for dabbling into so yeah great stuff thank you um Gavin asks, do MWIS have historical synoptic charts available to the public? Uh, we don't, but there is a website that's very good for, for past synoptic charts. It's one that's, um, I think it comes from a, a German website. It's wetter3.de. So that's wetter, W-E-T-T-E-R, three number three, dot D-E. If you could do a Google search for that, you can find archive, Met Office, charts and things like that and you can go back quite a long way so that's that's quite a good site we don't have the archive charts ourselves but we if we want to look back that's quite a good site wetter3.de um, have a have a browse great thank you aaron asks where in the uk would you choose to live if it was purely based on weather throughout the year <laughs> um depends what weather you want i mean if you want good weather and drier weather you'd want to be to the lee side of the uh, uh, the big hill groups if you want generally good um dry conditions uh, i suppose you'd, you'd sort of want to be around northeastern regions if you want to be to be somewhere near to the hills but maybe not being bombarded with the weather coming in from the atlantic all the time so you yeah i think interestingly i've occasionally been, been through the area and stayed in the area even even around the cheviots and, and places like that once you're in the lee of the lake district you can actually get if, as long as you've not got the north sea clag coming in on the southwesterly though those areas in northeast england southwest scotland actually do very well for, for a surprising amount of good weather um, on the right wind direction thank you adam asked this is a this is a good um pertinent question to me as a visit to, to North Wales. What is the difference for the marked difference in rain? Sorry, what is the reason for the marked difference in rainfall frequency on Anglesey in winter compared to say the Clinton Peninsula? Is it the sheltering effect of Ireland? Uh, between Anglesey and was it that particular way? Well, no, necessarily no. But uh, yeah, I, I suppose so. You, you, you've got a degree of um, it might be if, we, if we're thinking of that chart on the left, for example, it might just be that, that chart wasn't coloured in, but so, so be it. But there will there will be a, uh, an effect, I suppose, where you are just yeah, you are just in the lee, a little bit more of the Wicklow Mountains, for example, which can have an effect on on producing fewer showers there. Um, maybe that answers that a little bit. But but uh, yeah, I think again it comes down to very subtle variations in, in wind direction you, you just change any of those wind flows very slightly uh, and, and you can get um, yeah, some of those some of those local spots even even as far as between Anglesey and the Clean Peninsula as I say I, I must be honest with that I, I half wonder whether that just didn't get coloured in but there you go I think there'd be still I think you'd still be getting some showers on the southwesterly to be honest but there you go great stuff thank you uh, Iris asks any recommended apps for weather forecasting to download? Um, there's various ones. I'd always be a little bit cautious with, with apps because they only are as good as the data that goes into them straight off the model. And um, if you want, I suppose, the human interpretation, you're always going to want to be looking at what we put out ourselves. I mean, we're, we're going to want to uh, try and evolve our um, app-based content a little bit but it would only be to have our own um written forecasts out there there's one i think there's an app called windy which is quite a good one um which gives quite a lot of graphics um but as i say the one thing we'd always be a little bit cautious with in promoting app-based material especially for mountain weather is that it's trying it might you might think you're getting a sort of a, a, a location specific thing but you bear in mind that the um the topography, the detail that the forecast models have is not absolutely pinpoint. It doesn't pick out every single hill. So any app based content, which is getting very, very good in terms of what it will do, is only going to be as good as the data that goes into it. And sometimes that data will chop and change quite dramatically. So I'd always think we probably want to be uh, <laughs> promoting the, the human factor in that. But uh, there's, a, there's a few nice ones for graphics to say, I think. Uh, um, there's windy there's there's uh, even one off the norwegian um quite a few people look at the yrno uh, norwegian met service i think is quite good but 
always, always check out our human podcast as well. A few people asking if uh, you guys, MWIS, are going to launch your own app. Yeah, as I said, we, well, there's one that uh, is on Android at the moment, <clears throat> but uh, we're wanting to develop our own app-based content just to make sure you've got stuff that's on devices, you know, keeping up with modern technology. There's there's various things we've got in the uh, in the pipeline and the planning, and hopefully we'll have uh, some new new bits and pieces there for you. So yeah, it's it will carry all the content we put out basically. So yeah. Watch this space as lockdown ends. We might have a few new uh, toys to play with. Great stuff. Paul asks, how do you decide what you, words to use on your forecasts, such as arduous, buffeting, and ferocious? <laughs> um, experience. Um, what we, you know, we maybe have our own mental Beaufort scale of, of how to describe things. Um, you know, we've got experience of being out on the hills, and it's trying to tell it like it is for just what. Um, what you will feel because uh, it's surprising actually you don't need to get actually that much speed of wind to really start to feel it sometimes you can be on a day on the hill and if you're with somebody who's not as experienced they say oh that was absolutely awful that was absolutely howling we couldn't put up with that and you say well it's only 30 miles an hour and it's like you you really know the difference between if you're on like a just a windy day which is unpleasant between a day when you're on the hills i'm sure many of you do where if you were there and trying to do it on a day when it was 50 60 miles an hour you're hardly able to walk and anything more than that i mean it depends how experienced you are of walking in in the hills in the wind but but yeah arduous is the first level difficult <laughs> It's just where you can hardly get walking and it's just unpleasant. Um, but yeah, buffeting, I think, is a very good description for walking in the wind. I think that's it. Does, it's our favourite phrase, I think. It comes in quite a bit. But yeah, it's our own little mental Beaufort scale from, from being negligible right up to the full, you may be blown over. Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. One more question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um... Ben asked, to what extent do the computational models you use account for local mountain terrain and how much detail gets added in based on personal judgment? Um, I mean, personal judgment that we put in, we, we're always using our experience of things. There are some models that are getting very good. They're getting you know, right down to you know, a kilometer's worth or less of detail in terms of how they're resolving the topography, but they're only a simulation, they're only a model. Um, sometimes the, the newer models that have come on board in recent years, you know, they try and resolve detail, but sometimes they still don't quite grasp all the fundamentals of the meteorology that's going on. Um, so I think for the time being, at least, there's plenty of room for still needing the human element. That the, There's a lot of the, you know, the more technical forecast models that we use that are doing very, very well in terms of resolving topography. One or two that, that picking out the detail of freezing level across the highlands around the Great Glen and places like that, that they, they're get, getting very detailed. They're getting very good at what they can do. Um, but I think there's always, it's always for us, it's balancing the stuff that we can see with just our own interpretation of what's going on. Um, there's, there's still plenty of room for experience of the hills, especially you know, dealing with our, our side of forecasting. Great stuff, thanks Gary. And thanks very much for this evening. That's, um, I guess, all we have time for. I'm sorry for everyone who asked questions and we didn't get time to uh, answer those. But um, Gary, the, the website has, it carries uh, weekly sort of summary forecasts and things like that. It's a good resource from that point of view. Do you want to talk a bit more, just a one minute, sort of plug for NWIS, why everyone yeah. can check it. Well, uh, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, you all know and enjoy the content that we put out there. We know we've got the daily um, three day PDF forecasts that go out on the website. They're the ones that get printed out on all the notice boards that you see all over the place. They've got the website content that we do as well. So that's updated every single day. Um, we, you know, we give the uh, the planning summary within our forecast as well. The, the video content that we're doing um, hopefully going to do quite a bit more of as well as we go onwards. We've got the uh, the, the long range planning content out there um, twice a week at the moment on, on the video forecasts. Um, use both basically. You've got your local um, 10 areas that we have as our, our forecast for the mountain areas locally. Um, it gives you your local details. Use that hand in hand with the video. As I say, we want to do a bit more with the video content in, in the near future to try and give you that all round picture of what's going on with the, 
with all the mountain forecasts that we that we put out. If you have got any sort of questions, if we didn't get to any, um, you know, I'll try and respond on uh, social media if you want to drop any questions. If there's anything particularly technical that uh, give me a chance to have a look at and have a think about, I think there was uh, one or two technical questions that were in there. If you if you do want to just drop those in, I'll try, try and have a uh, a discussion at some point on social media and, and get to answer those if uh, if we can as far as we can do. Thank, thanks very much, Gary. I'm really impressed that you managed to squeeze that into an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking at your uh, your presentation earlier. I was thinking, I think this is more like two or three hours. Yeah, but... <laughs> well, that's it's it's, trouble. it's a tricky one. I mean, you're trying to get through as much as we can just to try and give you a snapshot of everything we do. But as I say, there's a six month or two year course in that somewhere. I mean, we we hopefully as times get better, we'll get back to doing our day with MWIS sessions. If you've not heard of those, just check out the MWIS website and. Um, where you can come and spend a day with us and talk all about weather and we can get you to have a go at some forecasting as well so as times get better hopefully we don't just have to do them virtually hopefully we can be out and about and see you in person if you want to, to book on one of those courses um we'll announce the dates as soon as we can it may be the summer it may be the autumn but yeah um it would be a very enjoyable day to to, to go more in depth than than just the, the flash of an hour so, Great stuff. Hope Thanks, Gary. There at some point. Thanks. And thank you, everyone, for Thanks joining for us this evening. Just if you, we've got a couple of um, couple more talks happening. Another one on Thursday evening, and then another one um, the week after. So uh, keep your eyes peeled on Facebook for that. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. And thank you again to Gary. Really good evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.